Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Coffee, Kids, and Sports Medicine here at Scottish Rite for Children at our Frisco campus. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone either live or is digitally or virtually uh, watching this. Uh, a warm welcome. Uh, I apologize today. I cannot be there in person. Uh, I will be on the YouTube chat. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate uh, to ask, but we've got a fantastic program today. Uh, the Growing Athlete's Hip, How to Prevent Problems Today and Tomorrow. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the uh, other speakers. As you know, my name is Henry Ellis. I'm one of the sports medicine surgeons uh, here at Scottish Rite for Children. Uh, I'm joined here today uh, by Dr. Will Morris. Uh, he's also a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he has a particular specialty in hip disorders as well as club feet. Uh, he, has, um, he is very... Uh, interested in the growing hip, uh, in particular, both at the infant level and at the adolescent level. Uh, he's going to talk today a lot about the development of the hip, particularly during the growth spurts in a lot of our youth athletes. Uh, I will tell you, he's had a remarkable article recently published about the hip click uh, and the need for a referral for evaluation for developmental dysplasia of the hip. Uh, we are also uh, joined here by Jessica Davis. We call her JDAB for short. Uh, she's one of our sports physical therapists. Uh, some of her true talents are looking at hip or looking and working with uh, those kids that have certain hip conditions, uh, particularly those dancers and gymnasts. And she's going to talk today about uh, some movement, movement patterns uh, that may be associated with uh, injury prevention. Uh, for this talk, I have nothing to disclose. Our objectives today are to describe uh, anatomy and pathology that are associated with pediatric and adolescent uh, hip sports-related injuries. Uh, we're going to describe some elements about the development of the hip in our youth athletes and try to identify some key features uh, on the diagnosis associated with them and how to prevent them and perhaps some good mechanics uh, to be concerned with uh, for the developing hip. Today, I'm going to introduce some hip conditions to get you uh, all uh, oriented uh, before Dr. Morris and JDAB uh, begin their talk. I'm going to start here with a 15-year-old basketball player. Now, he can come to our clinic and he can present in two different ways. First way is an acute injury. He landed. He felt a pop. And then you may read the x-ray report that says he fractured his pelvis or had an avulsion fracture. And you can see that here, he's got a chip of bone right off his lesser trochanter uh, that we call an avulsion fracture. A second way that this basketball player can present a little bit more insidious. I've had hip pain for six months. It's worse after a game. Sometimes I find myself limping. No injury was related to it. And you can see here, he's got some images, but if you just look at a slightly different image of his hip, you can see that he's got this extra bump around his hip that is associated with femoral acetabular impingement and related to labral pathology. We'll touch on all of those in just a bit. Before we get started, I'm gonna start a little bit about some of the root words and talk a little bit about apophysitis and apophyseal fractures of the hip and the pelvis. The apophysis is a word that we don't always know um, and maybe not part of our basic anatomy because it's unique to the growing child. The apophysis is a bony outgrowth that is really a secondary ossification center and typically has an attachment from a tendon located on it. Most common is your tibial tubercle apophysis in the front part of your knee. Many people refer to that as perhaps the location for Oshkid Schlatter. When you look at the root word, apo is away from phi or physis growth and inflammation itis. So that's where we get the term apophysitis. The pelvis has lots of apophysis and areas of apophysitis really all over the pelvis in the palpable areas uh, that you can palpate during your clinical exam. Here's two, two different examples, two females, um, one of which is a track runner, one of which is a gymnast. They both have insidious onset and here are their x-rays and these are really great examples of apophysitis. You can see it on x-ray here, the ischial tuberosity, that's where the hamstrings insert typically see this in your drill team gymnasts or dancers it's an overuse condition you can see the irregularity of that secondary ossification center the second one here is at the iliac crest you can palpate it on your uh it's very easily palpable uh, and you can see the irregularity of that growth plate too also an apophysitis of the pelvis uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned before, it's an overuse condition, almost, associ almost always associated uh, with pain. Sometimes they'll hear a crack or a pop, but sometimes, but most of the times we see it as kind of a wear and tear, kind of the same symptoms you'd see with tendonitis. Good news is the treatment, rest, rest, rest. Things like cross training, activity modification. In severe cases, sometimes you have to restrict them quite a bit. Crutches with maintaining some range of motion, absolutely no running. Um, and in fact, sometimes they've got to they've got to be symptom free for up to four weeks until I will let them return to sports. Physical therapy can be really useful. Sometimes these are associated with people who have tight hamstrings. And so this apophysitis is overused, but it can be related to tightness of the muscle uh, as well. I like passive motion for these, so stationary bike. And then when uh, the pain when the pain resolves is when they can uh, get back to the normal activity, as I mentioned before. Some discussion about bone stimulators. I don't use them. I don't think they're useful and they cost money. Uh, surgery, not really been effective. Some have advocated biologics like PRP or stem cells. I don't believe that they work and don't advocate for that. So when you talk about hip pain with an injury, so they hear a pop, they, they fall down. This is an example of Anna. She did the splits. She heard a pop. She almost said her hip came out of her socket. She said no previous uh, hip problems. Here are her x-rays, not really any significant findings, but an MRI does sh show that she has a strain uh, of the quadratus femoris. And I'll say that most hip problems or hips with an injury are soft tissue in nature. They're your sprays and your strains. Good news is rest, early motion with physical therapy. Recovery depends on the severity of the soft tissue injury. It can be anywhere uh, from two to 10 weeks. Apophyseal avulsions. Now, sometimes you'll see this as an x-ray where you see it fractured or you see pelvic fracture that may scare you, uh, but it's an apophyseal avulsion most commonly. Uh, these happen at the same apophyses, your iliac crest. If they hear a pop and they're tender up on their iliac crest, it, it's most commonly going to be an apophyseal avulsion. Other areas is your ASIS. Most commonly is your AIIS. Now, this is the one that you can't really palpate. It's deep within the groin, but they'll hear a pop and they'll have some pain. It almost acts like a groin strain and they'll, and, and they'll be tender and they'll have problems with hip flexion. And then your ischial tuberosities, which is your origin uh, of your hamstrings. You can all see it in your greater lesser trochlear or even your pubic symphysis. Here are some, some x-rays of some common apophyseal avulsions I'll highlight here. It's a great opportunity to look at one side versus the other, and that's why we advocate for an AP pelvis when you're looking at the hip, because you can clearly see the difference between the right and the left side. And on the uh, ischial apophysis, you can see those little fragmentation of the bone. That's a hamstring avulsion or an apophyseal avulsion of the ischial tuberosity. These happen more in men than women. Your average age is around 14. Commonly see it in soccer players in track and field. Most of the time, almost all of the time, we treat these without surgery. Protected weight bearing for three weeks. Uh, we, we emphasize passive range of motion earlier. You can see a common theme with that. I really try not to get them back before 12 weeks. They'll feel really good at six to eight weeks, but recurrent injuries are really common. So waiting 12 weeks can be really important. Surgical intervention, rarely needed, primarily for the ischial apophysis, uh, but those that are significantly displaced will initiate the conversation with the family. Just, I'm gonna to touch on a brief words about femoral acetabular impingement. Dr. Morris is gonna talk more in detail, but it's really important to know that this is an overuse injury and an overuse condition. You have that growth at the, the ball sits on the neck, so we call it the femoral head neck junction. That overgrowth grows as, as they repetitively flex their hip. You can see it pushes up against the socket. Now, right at the edge of the socket is where the labrum is. And over time, that will create recurrent injuries and eventually a tear uh, within the labrum. So this is called femoral acetabular impingement. This particular type is called cam type. It's the most common type that we see. A couple words on snapping hip. Two different types of snapping hip, and I usually say them, show me the popping. And they'll either, they'll either show you where you can hear it or they'll show you where you can see it. If you can hear it, it's most commonly internal snapping hip and the iliopsoas. If you can see it like this, it's uh, the iliotibial band or one of the tight tendons of the glute uh, max uh, that causes this popping sensation to occur. Internal snapping hip, also called coxus sult saltans internus. It's your iliopsoas. You can usually hear it, as I mentioned before. Uh, 
treatments, reassuring, it's all gonna be fine, hip flexor stretching, um, and very rarely is surgery indicated. External snapping hip, coccyx sultan externus, it's the iliotibial band. Sometimes I'll pain with walking or running, and they'll describe, hey, my hip pops in and out. I feel like my hip is dislocating. Not dislocating, it's just that IT band snapping uh, to and from. So that's just a little bit of a summary, or at least a, 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 an overview of some common hip injuries, uh, both acute and chronic, um, in our youth athletes. Most hip injuries are caused by soft tissue problems, although apopsial avulsions can be seen, and almost all of them are treated conservatively, but may require um, operative intervention. I'll tell you right now, little, little is known about injury prevention. Uh, we currently learn as much as we can. We're writing about it, we're learning about it, and we're teaching about it as much as we can. So I'll pass this off now to uh, Dr. Morris and JDAB uh, for their uh, perspective and a little bit more, uh, elaborating a little bit more on how we can relate some of these concepts to hip injury prevention. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, I guess thanks, Henry, who's joining us virtually for uh, the introduction. Just uh, to, to reintroduce myself briefly, my name is Will Moore. I'm one of the hip surgeons who, uh, uh, who also works at Scottish Rite, uh, and I pr focus primarily on uh, hip conditions that occur all the way from infancy, so dislocated hips, hip dysplasia, all the way up through adolescence and young adulthood. And I have a particular research interest in how the hip develops. Uh, including at the end of growth, so in adolescence and young adulthood. So uh, that's what we're going to focus on here, the growing athlete's hip uh, and how being an athlete may affect that final portion of the development. And I don't have any disclosures. So Henry touched on this a little bit at the end of his talk about the concept of femoral acetabular impingement. He had that beautiful animation where the femoral head collides prematurely with the acetabulum and can cause pain and ultimately uh, cause injury. And so the primary driver for that is what we call cam deformity. And so what happens with time is that you can see the femoral head becomes, uh, from instead of a spherical shape, becomes relatively uh, more oblong or cam shaped with, uh, with growth. And this happens in adolescents right at the end of their development. Uh, so over the next 15 minutes, we're gonna talk about what this is, why it happens, uh, why it matters, and ultimately how we might be able to prevent it in the future. So as Henry touched on with the animation, because of that oblong or uh, aspherical shape of the femoral head with hip flexion, that femoral head collides prematurely with the acetabulum. And he showed you with the animation that this triangular uh, cartilage there, with it, which is the uh, labrum, uh, can get injured over recurrent impingement after colliding multiple times. That can lead to labral tearing, so tearing of that O-ring of cartilage that rims the acetabulum, and with time can also lead to uh, injury and delamination of the cartilage itself. So we know that this can cause um, arthritis at a young age because you have this uh, sequential injury to the cartilage, and the way that we know this is from large studies, uh, primarily from Europe. So there's a great study from the Netherlands that looked at a thousand adults who were coming in with hip pain, got an x-ray and brought them back five years later. And what they saw is that patients that had this cam deformity, like in this x-ray, or sorry, like in this illustration, ended up with end-stage arthritis uh, five years later. Now those are adults and we're talking about adolescents, but it shows us there's a strong association when we have this condition causing pain and we don't treat it. The other way that we can look at this condition is with uh, which patients end up with early hip replacements. And so <clears throat> uh, there's a nice study out of our, uh, from our partners in Washington University in St. Louis who looked at over 700 patients who were coming in uh, with a, getting a hip replacement before age 50, which we consider early, right? We want our patients to have their native hip as long as possible. And they saw that for about half of those patients, the reason why they were getting that hip replacement was because of hip impingement that had not been treated. So uh, again, the goal, now that we know that this matters, is to try and prevent the picture that we're seeing here. This is a 35-year-old male who is a former athlete and has, you can see, that large cam deformity on both sides, as well as some early spurring around the joint, some sclerosis of the acetabular of the roof. So you can see it's this brighter white because it's already getting some damage. Uh, that's leading to uh, kind of changes that suggest we're on the early road to arthritis. So 
now that we know what cam deformity is and why it matters, let's understand a little bit better why does this happen? How do we get this condition? So to understand that, we have to understand that there's two different types of cam deformity. There's secondary cam deformity and primary or idiopathic. So secondary cam deformity means this is happening because of some other condition. Here's a few of the common conditions here. Uh, in fact, this condition was originally described related to trauma. So people would get a fracture around their proximal femur and ultimately ended up with uh, deformity that led to cam impingement. Uh, Perthes disease we won't really go into, but it's a, a rare condition where you lose blood flow to the hip and it results in a deformity of the hip and ultimately heals in a cam shape with this oblong or egg shape that leads to, again, premature collision. And finally, <clears throat> a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, which you can see we have displacement of the epiphysis. Okay, as I know Henry went through some of these definitions. Okay, displacement of the epiphysis relative to the femoral neck because of a sickness in the growth plate. This is a really common condition, so about one in 10,000, so one that you guys may see um, uh, in your clinics. But as this heals, just like we saw in the illustration, you can end up with asphericity to the femoral head. So let's take a look here. This is a, uh, a patient who, after they've healed, and you can see, just like in the illustration that we saw, prominence of that anterior femoral head neck junction. And you can imagine that when this patient flexes or internally rotates their hip, that this engages here on the acetabulum. Okay, you can see how it kind of keys in. And we know that just like um, other conditions, this can lead to impingement and injury. This condition is even further exaggerated by the fact that the femoral neck can become deformed. You can see how the femoral neck can kind of curve posteriorly. And so we can end up with uh, exaggerated deformity that really leads to impingement. So this is the most common version of what we call secondary cam, okay? But we're gonna now talk and spend the rest of the uh, session on idiopathic or primary cam. This means that there's no other illness, nothing else that led to this deformity initially. It's something that seems to happen in our healthy adolescent athletes uh, like this young man. So this is the example of the basketball player, right? That, uh, that Henry was talking about earlier. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening. So the Swiss about 20 years ago showed us that there seemed to be changes in the way the hip is growing as you get closer to skeletal maturity. They showed us that the epiphysis actually changes shape and extends down the femoral head neck junction here. And it's in this region that we see that bump that leads to the premature collision in cam impingement. Our colleagues out of the Netherlands, Rintje Agricola, showed us that in pre-professional soccer players, so high-level athletes, uh, that we see this condition develop very frequently. And this is one of the first studies that showed us that this seems to be an athletic problem. Importantly, showed us that none of the 12 or 13 year old athletes seems to have this, and this fits with what we see in clinic. This is not a condition that starts at a very young age. So we see all of these younger patients have a nice spherical femoral head neck. However, as they keep developing, we see that that area starts to flatten out. We lose some of the concavity and we start developing that bump uh, that leads to the premature collision. And as we keep growing and get closer to skeletal maturity, we can see that now that we ultimately end up with this prominence of the head neck junction, and that it occurs hand in hand with the extension of the growth plate, right, of the epiphysis extending down the neck. Importantly, they showed here in this study initially that there may not be any changes that are occurring after the hip is done growing. And I followed up that study uh, back in my time in Cleveland, looking at a big collection of radiographs of over 4,000 healthy adolescents from Cleveland from the early 20th century. They did a study we could never do today. They got x-rays of pretty much every part of the body, the hip, the hand, the foot, the knee, the ankle, and they got them every year as those, pa as those subjects were growing. So healthy kids, so a study that can't happen today, but we can still learn from. And what we can see in this example of a, a, pa a subject who got an x-ray at 11, and then 14, and then 17, Progressively over time, we can see that the growth plate, which is outlined here with the dashed line, extends down that femoral neck, and hand in hand with that, we develop this asphericity or deformity of the femoral head. And importantly, again, none of this changed after uh, the, uh, the growth plate closed. So this is something that happens right at the end of growth and then doesn't change. So the die is cast by the time we're done growing. Without getting into the weeds um, on other studies that we've done trying to understand why this happens, it looks like this may be an adaptive response that occurs to try to protect the hip. So we looked at slipped capital femoral epiphysis briefly, a condition where there's not stability and that, that epiphysis moves or weakens. Uh, 
uh, it looks like this may actually be a healthy response, the development of this CAM deformity, to try to protect or stabilize the physis. And so this seems to be a physiologic, healthy response uh, to try to help the hip in the short term, but we know now this leads to the development of CAM deformity, which we know has this long-term risk of early arthritis. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little about what we can do. So we know now that this happens right around the time that we're finishing growing and that it's associated with this vigorous sporting activity. Those first couple sports uh, uh, slides that I showed you involved athletes that are involved in basketball and soccer, but there's abundant literature about soccer, football, baseball, rowing, pretty much every sport under the sun. And we know there's a dose-dependent response between the amount of sport that you participate in and uh, the development of this CAM. And interestingly, if you looked at you know, asymptomatic populations, so everyone, in the, you know, uh, everyone walking down the street, you'd see that more males than females have this condition. But if you look specifically at athletes who have the same environmental stresses, meaning that vigorous sporting activity, the majority of males and females can develop this condition. So how can we prevent it? This is an exciting time. We now know when it happens, why it happens, when it's happening in their development. And so now the next step is how to prevent it. And I think the best thing that we can do is learn from uh, the only other condition where we've really made a, a probably big strides in terms of recognizing where this condition is happening and how to prevent it, which is Little League, uh, uh, little league shoulder, uh, el shoulder and elbow problems in, in pitchers. And so <clears throat> this is the other area where there's abundant literature that shows us that there's this overuse injury that happens, and we've taken steps to intervene. So there's these great MRI uh, studies that look at how the shoulder and elbow develop um, in, uh, in pitchers. And uh, if you look at MRIs before the season and after the season, you can see that the more these athletes are throwing, the higher the likelihood that they're developing stress injuries to the growth plate of the proximal humerus, rotator cuff pathology. And consequently, uh, we instituted pitching restrictions, right? The concept of the pitch count, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, to try to limit the cumulative load you're putting on that growing arm to try to reduce the risk of injury. And subsequent studies have shown that not only does limiting that cumulative pitch load help to decrease injury, but we also know it helps preserve performance. And there's even literature out of the Major League Baseball that shows you that decreasing that cumulative pitch load helps to in, improve performance um, in, uh, in these elite athletes. And so this is the future. This is what we need to do for the hip. And this is something that Henry and I are very interested in trying to develop, is how can we intervene in these developing hips in that narrow window where we know they're at risk to try to create a, a pitch count for the hip and try to prevent uh, this condition. So in conclusion, uh, you know, idiopathic CAM, we know now develops in adolescence. We know that it's associated with vigorous sporting activity and it may be a protective response that helps to protect the hip in the short term while we're developing, but comes at the long-term cost of CAM development. I think the future for our adolescent athletes is trying to find a pitch count for the hip, trying to intervene in that narrow window of time when the hip is developing uh, at the end of adolescence so that we can help limit that load and prevent the development of this deformity. Um, but the future is, uh, the future is still uh, not yet here, uh, and so this is an area of research interest for us, and stay tuned for hopefully our next talk where we can uh, tell you about our progress. Thanks very much. All right, thank you everybody. My name is Jessica. Again, I'm a sports physical therapist, and I'm gonna to talk today about considerations and components of a hip injury prevention program. Um, and so what I first wanna do, I wanna start out by uh, talking about uh, contributing factors that we really should use to guide our um, thought process in terms of hip prevention, um, injury prevention strategy. So first of all, we've got um, open growth plates uh, and peak height velocity during this time. Um, Dr. Ellis did a great job of talking about um, how the vulnerability of the apophysis and the injuries that are associated with it during this time of growth and then during peak height velocity is a time where decreased flexibility, um, where the bone, uh, bone growth is out, outpaces the muscle length, creates a um, unique um, situation separate from uh, adulthood or prior to that period. So this can lead to traction or stress injuries. And then on top of that, we layer a high volume of uh, sports training, um, especially over these last 15, 20 years with the um, increase in uh, organized youth sports. That's going to create a situation where exposure um, is increased to axial and rotational loading of the hip, 
Um, and so you've got uh, situations where that can affect the growth plate, like Dr. Morris just talked about. And then beyond impingement, you can also have situations of micro instability um, where there's excess movement of the femoral head in the acetabulum. Um, and then finally, um, the athletic demands on the hip are just unique in certain sports. You've got the deep flexion, internal rotation demands of the hip in hockey, for example, um, especially for goaltenders. And then you've got extreme end ranges uh, for cheer, uh, gymnastics, and dance athletes, such as your combattement in uh, flexion or your uh, combattement à la seconde in extreme abduction well above 90 degrees. And so we can't change necessarily the state of skeletal growth or the peak height velocity, but the rest of these really point to a certain level of overload to the hip structures. Um, and so if you look at the National Athletic Trainers Association position here on pediatric overuse injuries, you'll see a long list of factors. I've highlighted some of the modifiable factors that I'm going to talk about today. Um, including poor technique, muscle imbalances, and flexibility. And then here on the right, you can see the profile of that high-risk sport specialized athlete. So you're going to recognize some of these risk factors, um, such as increased training hours greater than their age. These are things that um, are um, to a large degree inevitable in some of the early sports specialization sports, but um, sports like soccer and hockey, we really want to control for those. Ultimately, as providers, our goal is going to be to um, protect the athlete from these risks to the extent that we can um, in the context uh, framework of their sport. Um, and so in the context of these risk factors, I put together a, a five domains of injury prevention strategies for the hip here that I'm going to talk about today. So you've got the training load management and education that we'll talk about. Um, we want to talk about the mobility needs for sport during rapid growth then lumbopelvic hip mechanics, and then how that feeds into movement patterns. Um, we've got to talk about muscle strength and balances, and finally, um, technique and sport-specific mechanics. So let's start with training load management, and this kind of picks up from where Dr. Morris um, uh, uh, had us uh, finished with. So, you know, we know that in certain sports, such as soccer and hockey, um, we see a higher incidence in hip pain later for those that specialized earlier. The evidence supports that. Um, and, and so we usually recommend sampling or a lower volume of multiple sports at a young age rather than sports specializing. But, you know, we can't deny that sports specializing is not going away anytime soon um, against the behemoth of the youth sports industry. And so with sports specializers, we advocate for regular workload monitoring. This is going to be your um, weekly training volume, monitoring increases in training volume, monitoring for poor signs of recovery, um, and for prodromal symptoms. Um, we see that uh, in certain avulsion fractures, there's an um, increased uh, presentation of prodromal symptoms in the month before that. And so on a broader level, this would evolve into a pitch count that Dr. Morris talked about, ideally, but this needs to be supported by coaches and then on the uh, sports organizational level. And one important theory to come out of the uh, model of long-term athletic development is that of biobanding. And this is where we would temporarily decrease workload as well as acceleration and deceleration task load during an athlete's growth spurt period. Um, so individually, you could determine that by measuring wingspan, sitting height, and standing height every few months. And then, um, you know, you could see when that spike occurs. And during this time period, we're going to replace that volume with neuromuscular training programs that emphasize balance, coordination, core stability, and uh, fundamental movement patterns. Again, this is something that would require support on an institutional level and from coaches as well. But as providers, our job is to educate the community on how really these recommendations are a benefit to them. Um, you know, we're, we want to build robust athletes that have, uh, you know, sound movement patterns, uh, which are layered upon with strength. And then finally, that feeds into uh, proper sports technique with speed. It's going to lead to better performance down the line and create uh, better athletes with greater longevity. Um, and then finally, we uh, always advocate for a few months of rest from the sport. Um, so uh, uh, beyond that, the next thing we want to look at is hip mobility during this period of rapid growth. The literature supports that uh, before, during, and after peak velo height velocity, there's a decrease in range of motion uh, and flexibility of the muscles. And in females, we see an increase in joint laxity as well. And so let's talk about recommendations for um, addressing hip mobility. So if you're looking for um, long-standing improvements, the research supports stretching and eccentric training 
Both of those have been shown to produce similar effects in flexibility improvement. With eccentric training, you also get an improvement in strength. With static stretching, especially with your hypermobile females, you want to ensure proper technique. So if you look at this hip flexor stretch here in the picture, you want to make sure that they're not hanging into that anterior hip capsule. We know that um, dancers with hip dysplasia demonstrate a thinning of the anterior capsule less than three millimeters, and so we don't want to feed into that pattern. If you're looking for more immediate improvements, then we have research to support dynamic warm-up and foam rolling. With foam rolling, this is something you would do for about five minutes, and the improvements in flexibility have been shown to last for 60 minutes. So I want to take a moment and uh, talk a little bit about eccentric training for injury prevention. Um, and so um, it's been shown to provide uh, benefits like static stretching, and the basis of eccentric training for strength is that it shifts the muscle length tension curve, which means you're going to be able to provide, uh, pr produce safe and optimal peak torque production at longer muscle lengths. So if you can do that closer to the end range, and then increased flexibility also decreases that traction stress on the growth plate, it's going to uh, create safer eccentric contractions. Now I've got an example here of the anterior hip, uh, hip flexors and quad. We've got the hamstring Nordics with the posterior hip, and then we have a frontal plane example with these adductor slide outs. Um, and you would start with a low volume bilateral before peak height velocity, and then progress the volume and the challenge. And so, you know, we've got the foundation of hip mobility. We need to layer on sound mechanics and movement control on top of that. Um, with especially our hypermobile athletes, we want to think about lumbopelvic control, but this is with all of these kids during this time of growth and decreased coordination. Um, with lumbopelvic control, we want to think about lumbopelvic and hip dissociation as we're going down into extension, which you can see with the single leg lowers of this gymnast here, and then also as we're moving uh, the hip into flexion, uh, which you can see with the bear crawls here, we've got a foam roller for a neutral spine cue. And then that flexion control is going to feed into a proper squat pattern. Um, so with the squat patterns, what we want to make sure is we want to prevent excess or early anterior pelvic tilting, uh, femoral adduction, or internal rotation, which you can see from this picture here. Um, these are the positions that are going to feed into that anterior impingement stress position. And so, you know, if you're in that position for a long time, like a lineman, um, an offensive lineman, or um, a hockey player, that's going to create repetitive stress. Um, we want to build neuromuscular control in single leg squat positions. Um, so you can see maybe from this picture, there's a red a band around the knees, and that can create that external resi resistance cue to combat that femoral adduction. But whenever we can, we want to use um, props or external cues to support what we are trying to teach and not use complicated technical um, explanations with our cueing. So we've got the foundation of mobility. Um, now we need to, and we've got uh, proper mechanics, we need to support it with strength. Um, you know, research into college and pro athletes uh, supports the adductor-abductor ratio as, uh, with 80% 80 80 as a cutoff here. We don't see that at this time in youth athlete populations, but we, what we do see is that a decrease in adductor strength um, increases risk for hip pain during the season. And so a study in youth soccer athletes um, showed that the Copenhagen adductor plank, which you can see here, uh, decreased the incidence of hip pain during the season. And then when they further layered it with the combination of the Nordic hamstring exercise, that further increased the benefit. So with our aesthetic athletes, we want to think about micro, uh, strengthening the rotator cuff or the uh, stabilizer muscles of the hip. Um, you can see we've got a rotator uh, exercise right here. And we also want to think about, you know, the, the deep rotators, the glute medius and the iliopsoas working to create centration of the joint during movements, centration of that femoral head. And then finally, uh, we want to layer on sport-specific sport movements to this strength, such as with this lateral lunge progression. And then finally, you know, we, we have all these components. We need to translate it into teaching proper movement mechanics before we layer speed on top of it. Um, and so this is a time where they've got neuroplasticity, and we want to build fundamental, uh, proper technique um, so that we decrease that risk of hip and lower extremity Im injury down the line. You can see there's an example of change of direction here and looking at that proper versus improper uh, lateral trunk lean.
So, you know, those are my recommendations in terms of specific uh, injury prevention strategies. Let's talk about the parameters. Um, and this comes from the injury prevention program literature as a whole. Um, the recommendation is that any of these programs be at least six weeks in length. Um, you would want to start it before or during the preseason. And then, um, you know, it could be two to three times a week, 20 minutes, or up to a full standalone session. But you need to continue them for effects because we do have uh, a detraining effect if you stop these exercises. Finally, the most important thing is to focus on technique. Um, we can't just have them go through the motions. Uh, it's got to be that teaching of how they're moving um, so they can carry that into performance down the line. And that being said, I just want to finish with a few examples here of sport-specific progressions, uh, or examples sport-specific in each of these different components. And so we've got hockey um, examples here where you've got dynamic um, and static Z-sit stretching. You've got the core uh, lumbo-pelvic dissociation. Then we have two adductor eccentric examples, um, a hockey-specific lunge pattern, and then we're finally layering onto the movement um, mechanics aspect with these skater exercises, he probably needs to get a little bit lower there. Um, and then I'll finish here with a uh, dancer, uh, dancer progression exercise. So these are some exercises, just one or two in each of these domains where, you know, we start with a tissue prep. Um, we want to build that longevity with the eccentrics, create dynamic stability, um, looking at a sport-specific position, um, end range control. This is a gymnast, so I would have her turned out um, for dance. And then a few sport-specific uh, strength movements here, again, focusing on turnout, because that's where they're going to live. That is all I have for today. These are my references, and thank you.